One thing the original Dark Souls does so well is indirect storytelling. The lore and history of the world, the role of characters in the story, and even the primary plotline of the game is told in subtle and interesting ways without interruptive cutscenes or gimmicky mechanics. One rare but just as profound method of storytelling in the game is music. Music characterizes the different terrible foes you face in the game, as well as your caring, or at least like-minded, allies. What I'd like to do in this video is take a look at the themes of two characters in the game, Guinevere, Queen of Sunlight, and Quilan, Daughter of Chaos. I'm going to compare these two themes and analyze their contribution to the character's personality and their role in the story and history of the world. Now with that, let's get started. After defeating the Super Londo Bros, you'll take the Spira Elevator to meet Guinevere, Queen of Sunlight. First thing you'll probably notice is... Uh, ooh. Guinevere's entire being radiates, well, radiance. The streaming sunlight and her soothing voice provide comfort after the intense battle. What was also interesting is her pose and clothing. The free-flowing robes and relaxed posture suggest rest and freeness, but there is also something stately and ordered to it. Her trust in you and the restatement of your quest conveys a type of clarity and assurance that your struggles are for a purpose. Now, let's talk about the music. Immediately, we are bathed in this powerful choir and organ on a pure A major chord, defining the piece's starting key signature. These notes hold their tonality for a whole two measures of 4-4 time. At this slow tempo, this conveys a sense of patience and stability. The next measure presents a fourth chord. Although that bass organ still holds the A root note, which again has this feel of stability to it, that there's this unchanging bass note that grounds us to the music. Two more held measures, and we have a five chord, and that bass organ is still rooted in the tonic, though. Also notably, we have kept close to this rhythmic motif presented in the first two measures. The next chord is, you might have guessed it, back to the tonic. And it's in the same inversion as the first measure. Composers set up a classic 1-4-5 tension and led us to a beautiful and simple resolution. This classical progression used since the Baroque times lends to this sense of purity and well-being that Guinevere represents. Next, we move into the minor third, and then to the sixths. These violins come in to add some variety to the pacing and keep us interested. Next, we set up a major two chord. Note that even here, the choir still stick close to the original rhythmic motif from the first measures. Again, that sense of familiarity and safety. This major two acts as a major five for the new key signature. And now the composer chooses to move to E major, which is the dominant of A major, our current key. Now this probably isn't a big surprise, considering that E is one step away from A tonally. And again, this predictable, but not uninteresting, change leads to the simple beauty of Guinevere. In our new key, we get a 1-5-4-5 five, five progression, now in descending blocks of half notes, as opposed to our previous rhythm motif. And jumping ahead a few measures, we see another simple progression.
Interestingly, the lead voices start off this bit with a rhythm of quarter and eighth notes, but they soon move on to these drawn out half notes and whole notes, like in the previous sections, almost as if in preparation for something. And that preparation is for the most interesting part of the piece right here, where we transition to E minor. The lead voices now outline this hilly melody over a 1, 4, 7, 3 harmony. Then we have an interesting progression which flips our minor 4 major 7 progression into a major 4 minor 7 1. This has a somewhat jarring effect because of the expectation of the major 7 like before. For example, wouldn't it be nice if it just sounded like this instead? This slightly jarring section conveys the sense of power and authority. I just listen to that slowly ascending bass and tell me that doesn't sound like an angry goddess ready to strike down an army of evil. Anyway, we take a major 5 back to our E minor tonic where we repeat the same section but with the violin added in a rhythm similar to its first appearance. then arrives back at our first chord in A major, which is also a bit odd as it would describe a 2 to 1 progression in the original key, but the step up from B to C lead voice gives us a nice run up for a smooth transition. So now that we've beaten the dead horse that is music theory, <laughs> let's see what this all means. As we said, the simple progressions, rhythmic simplicity, and unity of voices throughout the first sections of the piece all lend to these ideas of stability, familiarity, and purity of Guinevere's character. This music is comforting and easy on the ears, unlike much of the other pieces in the game. Even the parts of greatest tension, like the E minor section, aren't threatening. Instead, they remind the player of the seriousness of their far from over quest and highlight the powerful radiance of Guinevere and the Lords of Flame. Well, and now that we've had a nice time in the heights of beautiful Anne Orlando, it's time we ventured down past the depths, deep through Blight Town, and entered the domain of Quilag and the demons to visit Quilan, one of the Daughters of Chaos. Now, it's interesting to note the contrast between the presentation of Quilan and Guinevere. Guinevere is mandatory to visit on your quest and appears straight on through double doors. In fact, there is a straight path from the Anne Orlando bonfire right to her, almost like an invitation. But Quilan is completely optional and behind an illusory wall, almost as if she is in hiding and doesn't wish to be seen. And wow, wow, her design is grotesque, my goodness. This poor sickly being anchored to their position, hunched over in prayer. Very different from the relaxed pose of Guinevere or the similarly spidery Quilag. Also unlike Guinevere, she does not speak to you at all. That is, until you obtain a special ring and then you get to hear her equally sickly voice. I am afraid it may be too late. I am so sorry, dear sister. Breaking down the music, we start off this piece in a confused jumble of notes. Each of these voices come in at offbeat times before they are interrupted by this deep drum. Pay attention to this drum because it actually outlines the basis for the rhythm of this piece in 4-4 time. This inconsistent entry of voices repeats until the drum comes in again. establish our key signature with this tonic, A minor. Sound familiar? Guinevere's theme is presented in A major, which is another uncanny similarity or contrast between them. These next few measures are a mess of ambiguous chords. 
The voices are so out of sync with each other, uh, there are a lot of overlapping chords that produce this uneasy tension, which really accurately depicts a player's first encounter with Queenland. like instrument starts a subtle chanting of the root note in this extended measure which leads us into the next section of the piece. This section outlines a harmony that alternates on the four and one chords while the root is repeated by the glock instrument producing this dreary effect. Repetition gives a feeling of being trapped or doomed to some fate, which is the opposite to how it made us feel in Guinevere's room. A minor fifth takes us to a ninth on the tonic chord, which then flows into a major third, four, major five progression. The inconsistent rhythm and overlapping voices, the slow pacing, and the crawling tempo lend to this feeling of churning chaos. This is in stark contrast to Guinevere, whose clear progressions and consistent rhythm established order and safety. Here we feel uneasy and uncertain, but also sorrowful. The piece is not altogether discordant, and the melody that we do hear is expressive and moving. Next up, we have a really cool move into a major sixth via this progression here. These huge chords, coupled with that beautifully haunting glock, throws a curveball in the piece and catches our attention again. It establishes something more hopeful or heroic in the midst of this wandering sadness. But this doesn't last for long as we jump back into a familiar minor progression with In this final section, we start on our root and move to a minor fourth. We then hold this fourth into the next measure via this D played by the cello. We repeat this two measure phrase but staying right on the fourth, extending it to a seventh with this C and later to a ninth with this E. This in turn leads to a 7 extended minor 5th that brings us back to our tonic in the end of the piece. The transience of this 5th in contrast with the held 4th, made especially clear by this dramatic rise and fall of the soprano voice, hearken to that chaotic and unpredictable nature of the music. The return to the root gives us a brief resolution, but the final drum, which silences the choir much like at the piece's beginning, and the minor third on the glock, leaves an uncertainty hanging in the air before we restart the piece. Looking at the piece as a whole, we see a general unpredictability and inconsistency in the individual voices, rhythm, and structure of the piece. These elements are broken and out of harmony, reflecting the twisted natures of Quilan and her sister. To emphasize this, the piece employs that harsh repeating drum, and the harmonies stay close to home, never moving out of their original key, unlike what we saw in Guinevere, and sticking to simple progressions. These factors hint that Quilan's condition might be permanent and lets us know how it would feel to be bound to this place in her position. 
And of course, the instruments are perfectly chosen, with grating strings and a quiet glock accompanying the simple cellos and soprano voices. The slight pitch difference between the lead voices really capture Quillan's eerie but melancholy design. And like with Guinevere, we don't feel particularly threatened by this creature and her theme. The music is slow moving and gentle, if a little hard on the ears, but we know that this character is here to help. Now I could go on about the lore of these characters and how exactly the music pertains to them, but you can play the game and find all those hidden items and secrets to learn it for yourself. Or you could just check out the wiki, like I did. But like I said in the intro, Dark Souls 1 excels at implicit storytelling. Motoi Sakuraba delivers a powerful music that carries so much meaning and brings these characters to life. Music is what really outlines the nuances of the types of good and evil in the world of Dark Souls, whether it be the holy radiance of Guinevere or the gentle sorrow of Quilan. <laughs> 